This conference um, will now be recorded. Four o'clock this side. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining in today to this very first webinar of the 2020 and um, a very new decade. Um, I don't know if we have people who are new to and if we do have them, uh, we will give you details on how to become part of Yalta at the very end of this um, session. Um, you know, from year to year, everybody consciously or subconsciously wonders or even calculates how they anticipate the next 12 months to turn out. We do it in different ways. Some pray, some go for crossovers, some meditate, some go on solitude breaks. Some meet with friends to draw vision boards. Um, some just keep intention books, while some write down resolutions, and others just choose to go with the flow. In all this, some of us see ourselves not meeting the desired goals and look around us where we see people who are like superhumans. We wonder how they approach the 365 days because everything they touch seems to be turning into gold. We wonder what their secret is. Today, we are actually hosting one of such people who has a very colorful bio. And my guess is that just like me, everybody is just curious to find out how he does everything. I would like to introduce to you Derek Ashong, uh, known as DNA. I'm sure you can see um, as you look through the, the people who are joining us, we have DNA. That is Derek and Ashong, He's, who is the CEO of Amp It. He made it from a house with no running water in Accra, Ghana, to Ivory Tower of Harvard, which he attended first as an undergraduate and then as a PhD student, researching how open source, source software concepts could influence the content industries. He has spoken on five continents, including the UK Parliament, the United Nations and Stanford and Harvard Business Schools on issues of tech and society. He has been a TED Fellow, a Pollen Daisy Soros Fellow, and consulted on, for Fortune 500 companies in media and mobile. He's also an Emmy nominated TV host and producer. He has been a pioneer in producing multi platform interactive content, and he has also acted in a Spielberg film, hosted his own radio show for opera been featured by John Walker as a master communicator. And I am sure some of you, as soon as you saw the posters um, um, advertising the webinar, you might have gone on to research about him and have seen how intrigued uh, Oprah Winfrey was when she interviewed him and um, even gone to see the Johnny Walker um, video and seen how intriguing he was to the audience. And um, Looking at his very colorful bio, I'd like for Derek to go on and just quickly introduce himself and um, just go on a bit to tell us how he does this. Um, does he sit and plan? Um, does he just let it go with the flow or let it um, unfold itself in front of him? We just want to know, Derek, how have you come so far? How have you been doing this for the past many years that we see you have gone from strength to strength over the years? Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Fatsi. Can you hear me and see me okay? I can hear you, I can't see you, but it's fine. Okay. No worries, no worries. Uh, that is an amazing introduction. You know, it's so funny because as you're 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 speaking and you're reading the bio, I'm like, wow, that dude sounds incredible. Like he's done all this awesome stuff. Like, how do I learn from this guy? Because at the end of the day, you know, there is the the front end of what we do, where it's entrepreneurship, it's innovation, it's like a lot of time studying when you're in school and graduate school, working really hard to prove yourself in the working world, and then coming up with your own ideas and innovation. What can you bring to the table oh. that maybe is not going to come from the next person? How do you make a mark in whatever you do? And one of the things that I find to be really interesting in that is that we always hear about the, the good results. It's just like Facebook and Instagram. 
everybody posts the picture of them looking at their best and when they were at the beach and what they did when on vacation. Nobody posts the picture of them lying in the hospital after they had a triple bypass surgery. And so what I would say is, first of all, thank you so much to all of you for having me and for uh, joining into this webinar. I'm happy to be able to participate. Uh, I've known some of the founders of Yalda for quite a long time, and so it's it's a privilege to see the organization grow and thrive and to be able to uh, support in this way. But I also want this to be an opportunity for you all to ask me questions and to ask about the realities of what it takes to be an innovator, because there's a lot of really cool stuff, and there's a lot of more difficult things that people don't talk about, and I'm happy to have a real conversation about all of it. Um, Derek. Yes. You, you touch on a very important thing. We only see the end results. Um, we see the glitz and the glamour. We see the very beautiful Johnny Walker videos. We see your interview with Oprah Winfrey, but we don't know how you got there, as you've just said. And um, I'm sure people who are joining us today they want to know how exactly. Did you manage to be there? Do you do all these things that I just talked about? Do you meditate? Do you do a year plan or five year goal plan, whatever? Or do you um, do your vision board? What exactly do you do? Okay, Derek? this is a good question. So for me, there's a couple of things. I'll start on, on the tactical level and then on the kind of personal practice. On the tactical level, I think one of my particular skills or gifts or resources that I've tried to cultivate is to see beyond the obvious, right? So everybody will always look at like, oh, I wanna do X, and they'll focus on that thing. And that's really good. It's, it's a, for execution, it's very important to have the ability to focus. Um, and you'll also have this divide where people talk about those that have like big vision, like they're visionary, they're amazing, they've got these big ideas, and then those that are tactical and they execute and they see them as two different things. I see them as one and the same. They're two sides of the same coin. You have to have a big vision in order to do things that have a substantial impact, I believe. Sometimes you can get lucky, you want to do something small and it blows up. But usually, you have to think beyond just where you are to where you want to be, what are the implications of that, and what you would need in order to take it beyond um, the, the place where you currently stand. So a big thing that I do is I'll say, oh, I want to do this thing. Yo, that would be so cool. What would it take to actually do that? All right, bet. Okay, well, what would be the challenges to get there? What could happen that might prevent me from succeeding? Oh, this and this and this. Ooh, that looks ugly. As soon as you get to that point, a lot of times people turn around. Not in that they don't want to pursue their dream, but that they don't want to look at the ugly realities. They're saying, oh, this and that and that could go wrong. Why would we have that conversation about all the bad stuff? I want to think about the good things. I don't want to focus on the negative. I look at all of it. What could go wrong? What could be a stumbling block? What are my barriers to entry? What are the challenges? What are the resources I would need? What resources do I have? What resources do I lack? Who would I need to go to to try to figure out how to do this properly? I ask so many questions of so many people. I think there's a measure of humility that is required in my mind to succeed because at the end of the day, you could go in there like, yeah, yeah, I know everything. I'm going to do this and this and that. And then you wind up finding you're making mistakes all along the way, not because you're, you know, incapable, but because that is the nature of the process. The best laid plans will still find uh, they run into challenges. And so in order to increase your odds of success, it's better to talk to people who've done it before. You know, I have so many mentors, advisors, guides. It started when I was in college and I went to the Office of Career Services and I met a lady named Andy Diaz and I told her that I did not want to go into the traditional fields that they were recruiting students from Harvard for. I wasn't gonna do investment bank here, management consultant. I wanted to work in the arts and the entertainment industry. And I was really excited about innovation and technology. And she gave me a bunch of guidance just in how to begin. She didn't know those spaces, but she worked with me. And since then I learned, oh, there's a value in having that mentor figure and I continue to acquire them. So I would break it down into a couple of things. One, 
if you want to be really successful in doing stuff that's not what people normally do, you need to have a big vision and you have to be willing to be tactical about it. And what do I mean by being tactical about it? Well, that gets to the second piece. You got to look at what is coming. What is it going to take to get you there? What do you have? What are you missing? What are the resources that you need? What are the resources that you lack? How can you get them? What could go right? What could go wrong? Look at the whole big picture. Don't be afraid. Better you see it now than it catches you uh, unawares. Three, when you imagine all of those things, try to surround yourself by people who've done it before or at least done some aspect of it before so you can draw from their knowledge and you don't have to make your own mistakes. And then the fourth thing that I would add in that regard is try to look around the corner. Don't just look at what happens here. What happens if I succeed at this? Where does this go if I win? Where am I trying to be three, five, 10, 20 years down the road? And I don't mean that you have to map the whole thing out. You're not going to know. So many of the most amazing things that have happened in my life were completely unplanned for. However, so long as you have that ability to look beyond just what's in front of you and to think a little bit strategically down the road, it becomes so much easier to prepare yourself for those eventualities. So a lot of times people prepare for failure. They don't prepare for success. I think it's important to imagine what if things don't work, what could prevent them, and also to imagine what if things do work out, what would be your next steps. And that way you maximize the opportunities that come to you. Derek, um, listening to you and talking about how you go about doing this, um, you talked about having a big vision and being tactical about it. And to me, it, it seems as if you're saying treat your vision as you would treat or if, as if you would do your business model canvas. Have everything there, map it out right there. And then also, try to look at uh, have uh, prepare for the success and the failure prepare for both of them and um someone somewhere i think is also wondering um have you ever failed at something derek and how do you deal with failure if you have been because as we've been going through this we've only um had to um, experience some of the very beautiful things or amazing things that have, have, have happened in your life. And I think somebody out there is wondering, has Derek ever failed? And if he has ever failed, how do you approach or how do you deal with failure? Okay, I'm so happy that you asked that. I think this is the kind of thing that we need to talk about. Derek has failed more than Derek has succeeded, right? Of the things that I have tried to do, there have been more times where things didn't work out the way I wanted than when they did. That is the nature of the beast. If you go out and you look at all the people who are winning and you think, man, this guy makes every shot, how could it possibly be? You're not thinking about all the time they spent on the court or on the pitch or wherever missing shots for hours and hours and days and weeks and months and years of missing in order to develop the skill set to make a higher percentage of those shots than maybe most people do. So failure is a part of the process. It's not a nice part of the process. It's not something I encourage like, yeah, go out there and fail. Just do anything and let's hope it don't work out so you learn something. No, no, no. Obviously, Every time I try to do something, I try to succeed. But the way in which you succeed and what it takes to get there requires a lot of ups and downs. Okay. I'll give you an example of a win that didn't turn out to be what I thought and what then happened thereafter. Mm -hmm. I, in 2004, I did a, actually 2003, I did a remix of this song, this old West African song called Sweet Mother. I uh, recorded it partially in Boston when I was in graduate school at Harvard, and then I did it partially in Accra. I brought my band home. The sec following summer, or came back to the States, 
uh, put it out to some of my friends. Hey, what do you think? Blah, blah, blah. One of them is also a DJ producer. He had been doing a bunch of work in Jamaica. He was back in grad school too. He took it, chopped it up, made this sort of dance hall remix beat. I was like, that's so fresh. Recorded some new vocals on it, came back, and summer of 04, redid uh, a video, did a video for the first track in New York, video for the second track in Accra. That video in Accra exploded. We released it in the fall of 04. It charted number four in the country, R. Kelly, Usher, Beyonce, and then my band. Great, looks like a big win. And it was. Wound up on Mnet Channel O. Here we are on BBC World Service, RATV in Jamaica, reached 150 million people around the world. It was incredible. Uh, so we decided we were going to do something off of that Sweet Mother and Sweet Mother remix. We're like, oh, we can have the Sweet Mother tour. We're going to have this whole event. And we're going to start it with an SMT conference. And that is going to be SMT, Youth and the New Pan-African Renaissance. We did it at Harvard. We thought that we'd get a bunch of support from the university. We thought that we could get some grants and this and this and that. We got nada, zero make zippo. We figured out how to do it anyway. We pulled it off and we wound up having people coming from all over the country in the US, people coming from Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, all around this idea of youth and the new Pan-African Renaissance, rebuilding Africa for the 21st century. That conference happened in the spring of 2006. I got invited to do a bunch of other speeches and a bunch of other things, wind up and thinking about this amazing way that we could extend the SMT conference through SMT tour, SMT Sweet Mother tour, and actually do a show that talked about youth culture and the culture of the countries that we come from in Africa through the lens of uh, urban youth culture and hip hop, because that was the, the influence in the music that I was doing. I went and I spoke to a bunch of big uh, TV distribution companies in the US. I'm not gonna mention any of them, but you've heard of all of them. Everybody said, uh, no, nobody wants to hear about hip hop from other countries and especially from Africa, like why? And I was like shocked, like this is so exciting. This is so cool. I've seen so many things that would lead us to believe that there's a story here. No, no, nobody cares, okay. Then the other pushback was, have you ever produced a TV show? No, okay. So we can't help you. I put together a team, mind you, through that 06, 07 of people who really agreed and believed that this could be done. And we even hired a former producer from MTV. We raised money, not a lot, but enough to hire that person and an assistant producer. And we were working, working, working in our office and getting all this stuff together. And it was in 2007, which is the 50th year of Ghanaian independence. And we're like, we're going to do this amazing thing. It's going to be awesome. And I believe it was April, May of that year, just a couple of weeks before we're about to leave, we realized we didn't have enough money to go execute and return. So the project mm -hmm. stopped. Uh, everyone was like, oh my God, I quit my job. I was going to work on this. There were people in the US, there were people in Ghana, there were people in Europe that were all like, yo, I thought we were going to do this thing. What happened? And I'm like, we didn't get enough money to execute and I don't want to take people over there and not be able to bring them home. Frankly, we don't have enough money to get them all there in the first place. Yeah, but you just did a thing a few years ago. You took a bunch of people to Ghana. I'm like, I know, but this is on a different scale and I'm having to explain my failure to so many people who believed in me and people mm -hmm. who invested in me and lost all their money. Mm -hmm. Not a great feeling. That summer, we came up with this idea of like, well, how could we reframe this project? And we called it Take Back the Mic. And we're like, we can do it in the US first and then expand it to different places, TBTM. We did a little mini tour in the US, then we started doing some more stuff, a little bit here, a little bit there, little meetups, little meetups. By 2010, three years later, we did a big concert party festival thing in the Bay Area. And then, you know, it kind of again retreated. I say all of this to give you that. By the time it came time for me to start my tech company, we focused on this big data stuff. How do you con uh, uh, connect with audiences? In the meantime, and understand the audience. In the meantime, I'd done a lot of work, worked with Oprah, worked with Al Jazeera, worked with CNN, worked with BET, worked with Univision, worked with ABC Disney. All these different people around how do you build a show? How do you host a show? How do you produce a show? 
How do you budget and create and scale a show? How do you do interactivity across multiple platforms for a show? Because when I first started in 2005, people said, have you ever done a show? Like, no. Well, how are you going to do this? By the time I got through my training of myself, my building of the relationships, my learning how to speak to investors, creators, technologists, engineers, uh, PR people, all these news media, it was 2015. So from the idea coming to me in 05, to the first ST conference in 06, to the failure to launch in 07, it wasn't until 2015 that Take Back the Mic first got on the air and we did it digitally. Now it's 2020, five years later. Well, I have three Emmy nominations along the way after deciding I need to train myself to do the thing that people said I'm not qualified to do. Two of them were for Take Back the Mic. This year, 2020, we'll be launching it as a television format, the first ever format. And by format, I mean not just a show, but when you watch Big Brother Africa or you know BB Niger or whatever, that comes from somewhere. The voice, they got the voice in the UK and America and South Africa and Japan and China, wherever. A format is not a show. It is a model that can be replicated at scale worldwide. What format mm -hmm. has been born in Africa for television, non-scripted competition, whatever? This year we are launching Take Back the Mic Africa as the first TV format for a global competition that is born on the continent and exported to the rest of the world. And it's only taken me 15 years of failure to get to this success. Awesome, Derek. Um, listening to your Take Back the Mic Africa story um, um, and you uh, just narrating how you went about it, I have seen traces of perseverance, resilience and risk taking and of course patience because you're talking about 15 years of failure only now to have something huge coming up. And um, at this moment, I'm just going to throw this to the audience. I'm sure after they've listened to your story of failure and but how you've kept it, how you have kept it going and now you have something out of it, build networks, um, um, worked on your skills, now to have this very huge project coming. I'm sure they still have questions that they'd like you maybe to clarity on, or questions that maybe they feel you haven't touched on, um, those areas as you are just narrating your story. If, the, if, if we have anybody from the audience who has a, a burning question for Derek, um, this is your chance to do that. Do we have anybody who'd like to use this opportunity to talk to, talk to Derek? Let me say one thing real quick before you ask. Uh, ask. Uh, so I do a lot of public speaking, or at least I used to. I don't do it as, as often these days just because of scheduling and, and focus. And I used to say to people, I'm like, you know, some of you are never going to see me again in person. And you're going to have this opportunity to ask a question. And then I'll be like, are there any questions? Everyone will be like, quiet. I'm like, oh my God, I covered everything. My presentation was that awesome. They'll laugh. <laughs> but they won't say anything. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Thank you so much. We're all good. Then afterwards, there'll be 50 people lined up like, yo, Chelly, I just want to ask you this one thing. What about blah, 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 blah. So some of you are not going to see me on a webinar again. The uh, Bugami might be like, yo, D, you want to do the February webinar? I'm like, I did the January webinar. I'm busy in February. You're going to have to get somebody else. And so when you get the opportunity to ask those questions, seize it. Because the question you asked today may give you some insights that you may want and need to leverage tomorrow. Thank you so much for that, Derek. And um, I'm sure we do have a question or even an opinion. We are not just looking for questions, I'm sure. Somebody might have an opinion about how you went about things. Please, guys, don't be selfish about it. We also want to hear that thing that you might be having, that piece of um, commentary that you might be having that may be useful as we plan for the year 2020. So please, if you do, just use this opportunity to shoot because I'm sure we have a lot to learn from everybody that is here. And um, it's okay to say, Derek, that is not how I would go about it. This is how I'd do it. You know, because we understand that there are ways we deal with, uh, we strategize in order for our successes. If we do have such people, please use this opportunity um, to share your 
insights with us. Hello, Derry. All right, Prince. Yeah, I just want to find out. Anyway, I'm Prince Chaffa from Cam yeah, I'm Prince Chaffa from Cameroon. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I just want to find out how do you get along with um, something which is not in your field of study? For example, you went to school with a passion to do politics and you got into political science and you got a degree. And then later on, you want to get into waste management and it's like, you, you've got passion for waste management and stuff like that, and that's two opposite fields. So how do you get along? Do you get close to people in that field, or do you start all over again, go get some classes, and how, how do you sell through? This is a good question. So, you know, interesting, that that's exactly what I did. Like, my field of study was first, you know, uh, political science, focusing on African political economies, and then I moved into Afro-American studies. And then I went into uh, the music industry and technology. How, how does that work? And I think that the biggest thing is you, you have to figure out, first of all, what are the, the requirements to do what you want to do? So, for example, I know some guys I went to school with who became software engineers. They didn't go to school for computer science. They knew that they had to have certain types of skills and they developed those skills outside of university. Um, I have other people who went in and, you know, they were super focused in like, the uh, literature and, and the arts and English, whatever, and then they became investment bankers. And in certain fields, they will train you in the things that you need to know. In a lot of fields, like where I work, the, it's buck wild. There's no clear path to success. And so what I found is it's extremely helpful to talk to people who are where you want to be, or at least some aspect, have accomplished some aspect of what you want to do. You know, one of the things is like, I tell you the story of like 15 years of failure to get to the current success. But the reality is there are a lot of failures, but there are a bunch of successes along the way. And many of them came from meeting and talking to and, and working with and learning from people who are really amazing in their specific field, right? So I learned about, you know, uh, telling a great news story from Anderson Cooper's producer. I learned about how do you um, grab people's emotional resonance and, and make them feel a connection to the bigger picture from working for Oprah Winfrey. I learned about how do you tell an idea and message it in such a way that it resonates and carries forward and what you said can be followed by many others from a woman named Kazumi Meckling who was uh, a, a CEO of a, an ad agency. I learned from so many different people and I think that, you know, I don't personally know the waste management field, but if you could find people who either are in waste management or in infrastructure or are in, you know, uh, potentially finance, because all of these projects are going to require capital to execute the way they should be done, or in development, because maybe this has got a certain kind of impact, whatever, for government, maybe you need certain kinds of approvals to do these things that you may have in mind. Whatever it is you think you want to do, lay out like, I feel like I want to be here. And then look at all the pieces that go into play and talk to the people who are more knowledgeable than yourself. Because you may find from them like, yo, I got to go get a master's in bloom, bloom, bloom. Or you may find like, like, no, you don't need to get a master's in waste management. What you really need is an MBA. Or you really need to hire an MBA to do this thing for you. So you need to work on building a coalition that can do X, raise capital, have governmental influence, have an idea of how do you work with, um, you know, global NGOs. The point is, don't try to figure it out yourself. Talk to the right people before you make that move. Because you might go and spend a whole lot of money getting an additional education you don't need, or you might spend a whole bunch of time working on something that can't happen without some specific training. Cultivate a network of people who have the experience that you are seeking. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, yes, yeah, thank, you. thank you. I think that covers 
yeah, covers what Prince's um, question was about. Um, I will keep on um, switching bit between questions and then going back to talking about you, Derek, uh, your, your your life story, because I think there's so much to learn from your, your, your life story. Um, when we did the introductories earlier, um, Derek, you mentioned, or Bukamo mentioned that you are in Mauritius. And um, I just wanted you to just maybe tell us a bit about your history, how you grew up, um, ended up in the US, and now you are back in Africa. Is it part of... Uh, your life vision, or it just happens that you are now in Mauritius? Yeah, okay, this is really interesting. So I was born in Accra. Um, when I was like three or four, I moved to Brooklyn, Flatbush, that's why I talk like this. When I was eight, I moved to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. When I was 12, I moved to Doha, Qatar. When I was 16, I moved back to the United States, to New Jersey. Uh, when I was 20, I went back to Ghana for a bit and then came back to the States. So basically every four years until I was 20 years old, I would move to a new country. So I really had a global upbringing in many ways. I think when I got to college is when I became very, very much interested in Africa as a whole and, and Ghana in particular. When I was a little kid, if you ask me where I was from, I wouldn't say Ghana. I would say I'm from Brooklyn because that's what I could remember. When I was in the Middle East, I remember, you know, I never felt like I was Middle Eastern. I was New Yorker. When I got back to the States, I started to realize in my teenage years, like, there's something different in the way I operate and move in the world than a lot of my peers. And it was when I was in college that I really was like, yo, I am not like all the other kids. Like, I bring a completely different perspective. And I think it's an extremely valuable one. And just the way I was taught and raised to see myself and see the world, there was so much positive elements to that. And living in the United States, I was like, why do people act like Africa is somehow less than? Like, I didn't grow up with that. Um, it was very, very strange. And so I decided that I wanted to study more. That's why, as I mentioned, I, I got into a lot of, um, research in, you know, political science, specifically as it related to uh, post-colonial studies. And then I started expanding that and I wound up taking a semester to study in Ghana, coming back and writing a musical about issues of identity for Africans and African Americans. And then as I went into graduate school, I went deeper and deeper and I started looking deeper in the diaspora and studying Jamaica, studying Brazil and learn Portuguese and, and then continuing to study Ghana and coming back and forth. And basically, I got recruited out of my PhD program to go work for a, a very famous music producer. And I learned a lot about business in that regard, but I kept having this idea of like, yo, why is Africa looked at differently? I know so many brilliant people, so many capable people. I was never raised to believe that where I'm from or who I am is in any way less than anyone else. As a matter of fact, I was raised to believe like, oh, you could do anything and you know, you should just be the best, period. That was the baseline expectation. And so I think in my early 20s and then into my mid 20s, I just had this sense that I want to do something to contribute to the future of the African continent. And I started going home on a regular basis, once, twice a year, as a young professional, doing projects, building relationships, finding ways to just be and stay connected. And then I had this huge opportunity, as I mentioned, that pulled me out of graduate school, went to LA, couldn't go home for a couple of years, then went, then started a family, thought I was going to marry someone from back home, met an American woman who was amazing and wonderful and we became friends for years. And then one day I realized like, oh wow, like what I'm looking for has kind of been sitting here under my nose being ignored because it didn't fit all of the statistics and the check boxes that I had made for myself. So I married my best friend and it was the best thing I ever did. We had two lovely little girls and it was incredible, but this became a bit of a monkey wrench in the plans in the sense that, wow, she's American. My kids are born in the United States. Like, I thought I was gonna go home. And it is now more difficult than I thought. 
it's okay. Kept working, 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 doing all this stuff that I wanted to do. Had a chance to launch my tech company. Thought, hey, maybe we can test the technology in Ghana. Did a bunch of sort of feasibility study and realized that it was not going to work. For what I needed to do, it was too expensive to go back back and forth. The power infrastructure was not adequate. The internet speeds were not adequate. I was going to have a hard time dealing with my engineering team, which was further back. It was just too difficult. So I started um, my testing in Latin America, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Jamaica, expanded to Mexico, Dominican Republic, learned to speak Spanish, had studied Portuguese in Brazil, became able to communicate effectively in both on a colloquial or a business uh, uh, setting. Although sometimes it gets a little rough if you don't practice it for a while, but I, I, I learned how to do that. And then I got a series of opportunities that pulled me back to LA. So I moved back to Hollywood, did a bunch of work out there with all these interesting people. And then finally, I was approached by somebody about the prospect of doing something in Africa. And we tried to figure it out and it didn't work. Then I was approached by somebody else about doing a project in Africa. We tried to figure out it didn't work. Was approached by some people who tried to do something in Asia, tried to figure it out, it started working. And through that Asia project, I kept coming through South Africa just to check on some things, and then I'd fly to Singapore or whatever, then I'd fly from Singapore back to LA or go to Shenzhen in China. And through this process of exploring Southeast Asia and also keeping coming to Southern Africa and not West Africa, this is a very interesting thing because the continent is so big. And at first I was focused on what I know and where I know. And I realized it wasn't feasible for me to begin there. But the deeper I got into South Africa, the more I was like, oh, there's certain things that could work for me here. And that lended towards doing what I want to do back home. And ironically, as I'm learning these things about South Africa, I'm hearing from my partners in Southeast Asia that like, oh, you guys need to set up an entity in Singapore, in uh, Mauritius. I was like, an entity in Mauritius? That's so interesting. I'm like, well, they're like, well, we have one. I was like, well, yeah, you do, because every contract I get is signed in Mauritius. I was wondering about that. We started talking more. Then I find out, they're like, oh, if you're going to do this thing you want to do in South Africa, you should probably set up an entity in Mauritius. I'm like, what? I started talking to a bunch of my peers. They have entities in Mauritius. Then one of my partners was like, you know, Mauritius has got a very high quality of life, high per capita income, very good tax transparency with the United States, and all these different factors. And I was like, it's kind of like the 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 bridge between Africa and Asia. And I'm like, wow, everything I do is in Africa and Asia. Why have I never thought of this? So we started diving deeper and deeper and deeper. And then uh, in August of 2019, they had this thing called the India Africa Investment Summit. And they had these prominent keynote speakers like the Indian High Commissioner, the Mauritian Minister of Finance. But they wanted to mix it up with somebody who had experience in entrepreneurship and technology, uh, media entertainment. They wanted to talk about the art of entrepreneurship. And so I was invited to be the third keynote speaker after the, um, the, the you know, political figures. And it was such an incredible experience. I had such a good time. I met so many brilliant people. I felt like my ideas were uh, listened to and resonated, but also I found people I thought I could collaborate with. And so I sat down with my team and we looked at, hey, we've been thinking about where to situate ourselves. We looked at Singapore, we looked at Hong Kong, we looked at London, we looked at Joburg, we looked at Cape Town. Uh, Hong Kong was out for all obvious reasons. London, Brexit, uh, you know, instability is not good for business, wasn't a good look for us. Singapore, very attractive, very expensive. We're still a startup. We're not sure if that was the best strategic move. So it came down to Joburg, Cape Town, and Mauritius. And I went down to Joburg. Uh, I've been there almost every month for the last year, year and a half. And I was there in September and I landed and all of these Uber drivers are apologizing to me when I'm going to my meeting and back to the airport. Then same day I fly to Cape Town and they're apologizing when I'm going to my hotel. And I'm like, what is going on? Come to find out that they're, you know, had some Nigerians had been killed in Johannesburg. My whole family is bugging out because they're like, hey, Charlie, they, you know, people are not going to know the difference between Ghanaians and Nigerians. You need to be careful. I'm like, wow. Then I get to Cape Town and there's the World Economic Forum happening and simultaneously all these protests about violence against women because there had been a murder of a college student, university student. And I'm like, wait a minute, like West Africans under threat in Joburg, women under threat in Cape Town. Obviously, these are just one small part of a bigger picture, but 
I have to bring my half West African daughters and my wife to be in this place where West Africans and women don't feel safe and I'm on the road at least 50% of the time. No, Mauritius was safe and secure and peaceful. And that is why we wound up here. And I give you this whole context because at the end of the day, for me as an entrepreneur, you know, my pr job is to have that big vision, have the tactical execution of how do you get places, get things done. But a lot of it, the core of what I do is really risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. When you are an entrepreneur, you're taking risks all the time. Those risks need to be calculated. And you have to try to minimize the opportunity or the possibility of things going off the rails. Nothing's going to work out perfectly. This stuff is hard to do. Stuff is going to come up that you didn't expect or plan for all the time. I'm like literally in a daily process of problem solving. I love problem solving, which is why I do this job. But risk mitigation means of all the things that I cannot control, where I do have some control, how do I diminish the level of risk for myself, for my investors, my shareholders, my stakeholders, my team? And so the reason I'm in Mauritius is because I had had for a long time a vision and a desire to go back to Africa. I had to find the place where I could actually do what I need to do the way I need to do it. And it turned out that that pivot point between Africa and Asia was perfect for what I am trying to achieve. Um, thank you so much, um, Derek. I think um, you have pretty much touched on the next question I was just going to ask you on how, if, uh, you've, if you've had um, at any point in your life had, had the need to modify a bit of your life's philosophy and mantras um, or, or maybe how you've planned things um, to suit the, the situation or what was happening, the circumstances around what was uh, your, your life. And I guess you did really elaborate well on how you have done it and the reasons why you had to do it. And I guess this goes back to everybody who's listening that in as much as you do the planning, no matter how you do it, at some points during your journey to achieve your vision or to realize your vision, there'll be points where you have to modify it and you shouldn't be too rigid about it. You have to do that if it absolutely comes to that. And there's nothing wrong about modifying your the plans or the, the goals you have set for yourself. Um, thank you so much for touching on how it's important to go back to the drawing plan very often. Um, I think I can just um, open up for a second question or if somebody has something to say, an opinion to throw regarding what Derek has just said, um, we are opening up for that other question. Do we have that person who's ready to speak? Remember what Derek said, this might be the last time you're seeing him. Please maximize this opportunity. I have a question. Okay. This is my name is Achieng. I'm from Kenya. And just listening to Derek is so inspiring. Um, he has given an outline of very many things that we can all draw from. Um, but my question is this because listening to his story, it's punctuated with a lot of failure. And everyone talks about failure as a pathway to success. John Maxwell talks about failing forward. Um, but my question is when you, you are in that state of failure, you rarely think about moving forward. You, you, barely, you can barely think about the next step. So what kind of a mental frame do you need to have? And Derek has mentioned that you need to learn from your failure as a way of building your skills and competencies. But what kind of, um, sorry, what kind of mi mindset do you need to have so that you, you can have a bounce back, um, so that you can um, refocus your energy to achieving this big dream even after you have failed? Because so often we talk about failure being a pathway to success without considering that some people um, take a much longer time to bounce back and some people just totally do not recover from failure. So that, that would be my question. This is a, another good question, and thank you, Aching, for that. So, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I mentioned early was that I believe in having a big vision and then having a tactical approach to executing it. But that one of my skills, I think, is the ability to see around corners. 
so that you look at what is happening and what might happen and after that, what might happen after that, what might happen after that? Uh, what are the implications? If X, then Y, then what have you. And I found for me personally, doing this really, really helps when you run into problems, challenges, failures. Because a lot of times I'm like, oh, I want to do this thing. But I'm not just about this thing. I know that I really want to get to this point over here. So if I'm trying to do this thing and I find that like, oh, there's a challenge there, or oh, there's a competitive ecosystem, or oh, somebody's already done it in such a scale that I could not, blah, 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 whatever it was, oh, I couldn't get the resources, oh, I couldn't, whatever. It's not that it doesn't matter, and it's not that it doesn't hurt. It's just that my whole life is not wrapped up on that one step. The way I look at it is all of these are steps towards this journey that I'm on, and there are many different paths to get there. You see, if you just set one very small goal, the challenge with small goals as an, as an end unto themselves is if you don't meet the small goal, then what? What's left? If it just takes from here to here to get where you want to be, there can only be but so many paths there. If you set a big goal, a big audacious vision, a big thing in your mind for you, for your community, for your society, for your company, for your family, for whatever, you set a big goal that's hard to do. Well, the obvious challenge is it's hard to do. But the advantage is there are many ways to get it done, right? If I want to walk from my bed to the bathroom, there's only one path, right? If I want to walk from my bed to the store on the corner, Maybe I could duck by an alley, go another place. If I don't want to walk from my bedroom to like the next town over, oh, there might be one main road. There might be some side roads. Once I get to the town, I go on this, 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 this to get to the bank wherever I want to go. The further you want to go, the more paths there are to get there. So one of the ways that you mitigate the impact of failure is to set big goals. Because just because, oh, I bumped into this thing. Okay, I'm going to go next. I bumped into this thing. Oh, I go next. I bumped into this thing. Okay, but either way, I keep moving forward, forward, forward. That gets me where I want to be. Th that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, a lot of times we get caught up in what didn't work out. But there's so many things that did. I had this idea of what I want to do in 05, and it didn't happen. In the midst of the 15 years it took to get from there to here, I got married. I got two beautiful little girls. I worked with all these luminaries, the best people in the in the world at what they do. A couple of hundred million plus selling record producers. Work with the most powerful woman in television. Work with a multiple massive publicly traded companies. Learned how to raise capital. Raised my own public profile. Became known as an expert in certain fields. I had something I wanted to do. I haven't done that yet. But because I had the big vision, I realized that all these little things were taking me towards that end goal and that there were many successes along the way. So I think it's a combination. One, think big. Don't be afraid to be audacious. Don't let people tell you, oh, you come from this or that or that or you don't know this or your mommy is not this or your father is not that. Like, who cares? People defy the odds every day. Why not you? Why not? And frankly, for the future of the African continent, it requires us to do this. It requires those of us who've been given access and opportunity and education to go out and flex so that more people can have access because we are going to help provide it rather than waiting for solutions to come from outside. One, have a big vision. Don't be afraid of that. Two, count your blessings. See the successes as they go. Because so many failures, I can think of like people who literally I had a conversation with somebody recently and I was like, oh my God, this investor put me through all of this drama. And then they did this that they said they would do. And then they didn't do this other thing that they said they would do. And it was so disappointing. And I didn't let it get to me too much. It hurt, but I've been through so much through this process that I built some resiliency. And I was like, it doesn't matter what's next, the next path to get to my bigger vision, ironically, the path that I had to take to get to that bigger vision 
led me to so much better things, more investment, more allies, more strategic partnerships, more business development, more whatever. Another thing we had a few years ago where we had this huge opportunity with this massive company I'm not going to name, but it's one that everyone on the planet has heard of. And they said they want to do something with my little tiny company. We were like, yes, oh my God. And they gave us, this is the proposal that we want to do. We're like, this is amazing, better than we could have expected. It went to the lawyers. They're working it out. Turns out that some things went down. The um, senior executive in charge of the entire division we were dealing with got fired. All of his deputies fired. Our deal evaporated. That was in 07. Uh, I'm sorry, 2017. Now it's 2020. I'm looking back and I'm like, oh my God, in three years, if I had done that project where I was back then, we didn't have any of leverage. So what we did and created, they would have owned the asset. Now we've learned so much. We've moved so much further. When I go into negotiation now, I own the asset. My business is better off because things didn't work out back then. The basic point is you can't let the failure get you down by focusing just on that thing. If you keep mm. the big vision, there's lots of different paths to get to where you want to be. Um, thank you so much. I think you have um, answered uh, Achim very well. And um, as you were talking about not being afraid to go crazy when you dream, but still keep to the fact that you have to look at the small successes and count them as blessings. Um, you reminded me of what I learned over maybe the past two, three years. And I'm going to be the first one to admit that um, maybe the last year didn't go as I would have wanted it to. But because I was taught by somebody that um, make a way to count your blessings, somebody taught me to keep a gratitude um, jar where you like every, every day you have to have something that you're thankful for note it down and then maybe throw it into that gratitude jar. And um, at the end of the year, as you sit down to reflect over what has happened over the past year, you take out those little notes that you're writing to yourself. And when you sit and reflect, you see that despite you not achieving the bigger picture, you have gotten so far. And um, thank you for really highlighting that, Derek. And I guess people are taking notes on on how it is very important to count your blessings. It's on, not only good for you just doing it, but it's very good to really train your, 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 your mind frame, how you take in the failure, because there's something that you can look at and then say, you know what, despite all this that has happened, there's something to be grateful for at the end of the day. And I think that is one thing people should really take away from um, today's webinar. Um, and the fact that we shouldn't be afraid to dream, go crazy when we dream. And maybe even be able to break down that very big vision or the big uh, picture that we have and maybe break it down into smaller things so that we know how to maneuver as we go through the journey of achieving the vision that we have for our lives. And I think I'm gonna open up to the next question because I'm sure because we are hitting up more questions and um, or maybe even opinion people have how they deal with things please be free to share um any word nugget of wisdom that you might have for us prince i see you've switched on your mic do you have anything to say yeah <clears throat> i've got a quick one very please um i'm a little tempted to think that um 90 percent if not 100 percent of your um, dreams and big dreams and visions came from your early childhood exposure because um, many a times I, I grew up from a very remote village and didn't get any exposure. I mean, the highest car I've seen in my early childhood was a rough cat and you hardly even see a nice building. So it, it limited my dreams a lot. It's just recently I started getting some little exposure and I think that exposure is getting me thing um, beyond my environment. So if your exposure contributed to your dreams, how would you advise us or young people around to get exposure? Yes, okay, so wonderful. And thank you for that, Prince. I think my exposure definitely contributed to my dreams because what happened as I was growing up is that exposure 
increased, increased, increased all these different things. I started from a very humble beginning. My parents moved on. My dad was the first from his family to go to university. He moved me across the world multiple times. I, I remember uh, when I was in the Middle East, I used to get to go to the ambassador's residence for events. I didn't even know what an ambassador was when I got there. And yet then it exposed me to all these things that by the time I went back to the States, the kids in my public school didn't really, hadn't had some of those experiences. I think a lot of it is like putting yourself in the path of opportunity and being open to new experiences. So sometimes, you know, when we're starting from a humble beginning, the level of expectation of the people around you is at a certain phase. Like people are thinking, well, you come from this background, so you're gonna do this. And what I think is like the opportunity to read, to whether it's books, magazines, articles, whatever, to see what other people are doing, the opportunity to watch and look and see what's happening in different parts of the world and just get the idea of what do I care about? What's exciting to me? And think, how can I learn from what this person did or that person or that person did to contribute to what I want to do? Because at the end of the day, like, that exposure is something that sometimes we have to create for ourselves. I mean, I've been able to see and, and do things that my parents would have never dreamed. I've been able to offer my family opportunities that they never thought they would have. And I'm not even close to where I want to be yet. So I think that, yes, it can be a challenge if you don't have the exposure to all of these things. And frankly, when I got to college, you know, uh, I, I hadn't seen many of the things that a lot of the kids who went to prominent private schools and who had come from money that they had seen, and yet I had seen more than some others. My roommate was a, a kid from Golden State, Washington, uh, Goldendale, Washington State, 100 miles from the nearest airport, very non-diverse community, uh, conservative. He's what Americans would call a redneck. He would walk around Cambridge, Massachusetts, looking up at all the tall buildings. If you've been to Cambridge, the, the buildings are not tall, but for him, it was amazing. Now, here I am, this kid who was born in Africa. Here is this kid born in the United States, and I am helping him have a more cosmopolitan experience because I've seen more of the world. we all starting from different points, but by giving yourself that idea of what do I care about, what am I passionate about, what do I love, then read and watch and view and share about those things that very process is going to expose you to things you hadn't been exposed to before, introduce you to new kinds of people. And sometimes it requires a, a conscious fight against the limitations where people will say, you can't do that. Like, we haven't even gotten to this part. The number of times people have told me, you can't do that. You can't do that. Not that it can't be done. You cannot do that. I, I, my whole career is literally accomplishing stuff that people taught me, told me was impossible for me to accomplish sometimes for anybody to accomplish. So I think that exposing yourself and being willing to combat that lack of expectation, that because you come from this background, you've only been exposed to that, you're never gonna do this. Reading about the stories of other people, I found to be extremely uh, profound because I've seen people who started with less than I did and ended up with more than I have thus far. And it shows me that that journey is possible and I have to have faith. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Just wanted to find out if you are satisfied with Derek's response. And I guess you are with what you said. Um, as you, you've been talking, Derek, I'm just curious. Um, do you do you keep a, a journal or a diary of some sort, or you just pounce the year on the year without having anything written down? I'm sure people are wondering, okay. He has talked about the video. Yeah, okay. How do you go about, if we break it down into years or months, how do you do it? I mean, I have a business plan. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe <laughs> it. I don't really journal. My schedule is crazy. My mother encouraged me to do so when I was a kid, but I never got into it. Um, I do write down what I'm thinking. Sometimes I have ideas. Like if you look at the notes on my phone, it will just be a mess of what is this because i'll be thinking about different kinds of things related to different kinds of things and i'll write them down 
long before I had the business plan for my company and uh, scoped out the technology and what it would take to build it, I started writing out what I wanted it to do, what I wanted to build, what it would impact people, how it would change the marketplace, how I would like people to engage with it. As I became more sophisticated in my understanding of the market and what was possible, I would write more and more down, more and more down, more and more down. Most of the stuff that I've written, it, it couldn't even go in the business plan. But every year I'm writing, this is what I'm thinking. What about this? What about this? What about this? I'm always, uh, some people do it in a more organized fashion. I am not recommending to do it the way I do. When I have an idea, I just write it down. So they're all over the place, but I know where to find them. I know where they are. I know how to go and grab them and use this one and that and this and that and this and that. And I try not to reinvent the wheel. If I'm thinking about something that I think it makes sense and then I have another idea, I look at the old ones. I consider them. I wonder because what winds up happening is my understanding and the depth and the sophistication of my perspective on how to go about things becomes much, much deeper over time and giving space to all these ideas. They're not all good ideas, but they're all mine. So I respect them. Sometimes something that you're thinking that seems crazy today may be brilliant tomorrow. And so I just don't believe in thinking about something, then just let it go. I write it down. I keep it somewhere where I can come back to it someday, hopefully. And as I go, I do lay out from the business perspective this year, next year, year after, year after that. What do I have to do to get to where I want to go? And I realize that a lot of times it takes longer and it's much harder than you think. So that's where that resilience, that faith, that, hey, I have a big vision. There are many ways to get there. I'm not going to be stopped just because things get hard. One of the, the biggest criteria, I would say the two biggest criteria I would give to success are one, develop the skills that are required to be good at what you plan to do. Don't just be out there like, oh, I wish to do X and then, and it's me, so why not? Like, no. Be good at it. Be great at it. Be the best. Two, believe in yourself and don't give up because it takes time to accomplish anything. And you'd be shocked at what time can do in your favor if you are consistent. Oh, caller one has just left and I could see the mic was on, so I thought they had something to say. Um, uh, Derek, um, you know what, I'm just going to keep on just sharing on the bits. Some might sound very crazy, but I do those things and I think they have helped in uh, over time. As you're talking about um, going back to your what you've written down, there's something that I, I've just uh, started doing also in, in addition to keeping that gratitude jar. I have also decided that I write a letter to myself that I read after a year to see <laughs> uh, what has happened. That's and great. Guys, <laughs> guys I, I think that there are things that you do that we would want to hear, we would also maybe want to experiment with as you prepare for the year. Maybe they might add value to how we, we plan for our years. Please just feel free to also share those little things that you do as we are talking to Derek. Maybe we might maybe borrow a, a lift from what you do too. Please be free to share what you do. I think I'm just going to do something unconventional. I'm going to pick on a person. Um, uh, Africa Youth News, is your mic, mic accessible? Can you switch your mic on and just share what you do to prepare for a year with us? Because I want to pick on random, we can't have the same people talking. So I'm just going to pick on random people. If not, it's fine. We can move on to the next person who's free to talk. Um, Africa Youth News, do you have anything to add on to what you do when you prepare for the year um, and maybe what you did when this 2020 started to get ready for the decade? Because this is a very unique year. It's a special one. It's not only a new year, but it's a new decade, decade too. So I'm sure people did a lot in preparation for this. Do you have anybody who would want to say something? Hmm. Okay, if, I'll, I'll go if people are not. Uh, I want to ask, I want to ask oh. a question. This is Chuk. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, this is Chuk. Um, Lagos, Nigeria. I would like to ask a question. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Um, over time, there have been talk about um accountability partners and you know being accountable uh, of getting someone you know with whom you can be accountable for your goals. So I want to ask Derek, uh, did he utilize accountability partners 
or if it did, um, how effective was it? Interesting. So when I was coming up, and I'm a lot older than I look, um, you know, I, I give thanks for good genes and shape or thought. But basically, I didn't have this concept of accountability partners. At least I had never heard about it. What I did have was some close friends and some mentors that meant a lot to me. And basically, you know, one of the things that we haven't discussed that what you're getting at is it, it really, it's quite important. You see, it's not enough just to set your vision and set your tactics. You got to share it. You have to share it. And I don't mean share it with everybody because some people will come in and they will just piss on your dreams and crush you before you get started. It's not necessary. And I also don't mean that everyone has to believe in everything you do. And, and it's not good to have folks that will, you know, like challenge your ideas, iron sharpening iron. But you have to have have the right balance. You don't just need people like, whatever you want to do, it's going to be great. Or people are like, whatever you want to do, of course you can't accomplish it. You have to find the right balance of folks who can support you and help you to improve upon your capabilities to succeed. By saying what you want to do out loud, by manifesting it, by putting it out there, you have people who are going to be like, oh, so what did you do? So you said you were going to do this thing. How did that go? Oh, and what about this? Have you done X yet? Because sometimes in the you know, depths of your own moments, difficult times when you've been dreaming about this particular opportunity and it's not working out the way you want, you can be discouraged. You may forget, you may change your mind, which is not necessarily a bad thing, by the way. Change is a part of how you get to success. But it's critical to have people who you vocalize your vision to so that they can respond and you can be that iron sharpening iron until and they can hold you accountable as you say to get where you want to go or to do what you said you were going to do uh for me my accountability partners have been very important very close friends who i speak to about what i want to do my wife who's a part of everything that i do my family i talked to my dad i used to talk to my mom unfortunately she's no longer with us i remember what she taught me i think about her daily i imagine what she would want me to do and what she would want me to represent. So even though she's no longer with me physically, she still holds me accountable. And I think that that sense of a responsibility to something bigger than yourself is massive. Because I could tell you have a big dream, create taxes to do it, believe in yourself. You can be like, yeah, I'm just gonna be the bestest, richest guy and where I come from and I'm gonna stomp on anyone who gets in my path and I'm gonna get all the chips and all the dips and it's all about me. And I would be so sad um, to see gifted people go down that route. There is a philosophy in the world today that success is defined by how much you accomplish and what you get out of life. I personally think that success is more realistically defined by the impact that you have on the lives of other people. The ability for your success to generate success for other people. I think it is a better model, a more powerful model, a more sustainable model. I think it's the kind of model we need for Africa. I think it is the kind of model that young African leaders should embrace wholeheartedly. I want you all to win as an individual. I want your winning to not come at the expense of other people, but to be a part of elevating all of us. That's what we need. And so, yeah. I want people who hold me accountable for my achievements, but also for my identity and for my ethics, my values, so that hopefully my success is something that uplifts my community rather than takes away from it. Thank you so much, Derek. And Chooks, thank you so much for bringing in that new concept. Maybe we knew about it, but we didn't know it's called accountability partners. Um, it is very important to have accountability partners because it also keeps reminding you that you have a purpose to serve as a person, just like you, Derek, has been saying, that you, you know what, um, you are accountable to somebody at the end of the day, not because not just because of the dreams that or the personal dreams that you want to uh, reach um, as an individual, but also because I believe we, we are here to also serve our communities if you have those accountability partners to tell, okay, to talk to them, to say, okay, they ask you, what have you planned for the year? 
at the end of the year they say have you, what have you achieved um within the list that you had of all the things you had wanted to achieve over uh, the the 12 months what have you achieved it's important to have such people and chooks thank you so much for introducing that i'm encouraging people to tell us about these rituals that they do or these concepts because i think it leaves us with something new to go and think about and maybe even try and experiment with so um do we have sure. somebody who Yes, yeah. I can go because this topic for me is one that is very pertinent and extremely important. And in fact, you're one of my sharing partners. So you know what I went through beginning of this year anyway. Um, and Derek, thank you so much for inspiring us today. You know, when you said su success is about making the impact on other people and the ability for that success to generate success for others. I just thought about the quote that I have at the end of my email. And it's a quote by Nelson Mandela. And he says, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. And so I think that is very important because it allows to you to put your life in perspective, especially when you go into difficult times. And I will talk about that later. But to answer your question, um, Patsy, about the ritual, um, my thing is that I have various ways that I think about the year or how to start the year or the decade. And I will go on a personal retreat, two, three days, just be by myself, um, maybe in a hotel or somewhere where people cannot reach me. Mm, I'm uh, muted and I can't talk to him. And try and not um, communicate with other people um, just so that I can really, really focus. And during that time in my retreat, I focus also on my spirituality, where I, I will either go to church or I'll look at something um, online and just take my time with prayer and being spiritual, just so that I can seek guidance from a higher power so that I'm able to kind of look at where is my life going? How has my life been? What can I be grateful for? What can I look forward to? And just get that to help me now dream about what we what what I need to do for the year so that second thing is very very important during this re personal retreat of mine and then once that is done um or during that retreat I actually you know do a quadrant where I look at my life my personal life my professional life my spiritual life and my health that that's basically my my active my sporting life and i just look and say okay what are my goals gonna be for this year in terms of what it is that i want to achieve and i write them in those four quadrants and i try and see are they balanced am i going to be able to achieve what it is i want to achieve this year and what is it that can wait for next year or a couple of years? What is it that I really, really need to do now? And I try and keep my list to three or four main important things. And one of those things in the list is how am I going to make an impact in other people's lives? And I will drill it down a little bit more because some of you know my, my life's motto, but how is it that I'm going to contribute to creating jobs for young people on the African continent. <laughs> so it's big, but I need every year, I need to be thinking about that. And how is it I'm gonna be working with the elder to achieve that point. And then the third thing I do is I go and talk to my mentors and all throughout the year, which Derek also talked about and talking about with my mentors, just sharing what my goals are for the year and getting their um, perspectives on um, what I plan to do for the year. And it's good because they are, like um, Derek said earlier, seasoned in what they have done. They've got a wealth of knowledge and wisdom and sharing plans with your mentors. And if you don't have one, please try and get one. It's very important. And then also sharing with what uh, Chuk said, your accountability partners or people who you trust who will be able to give you feedback 
on your uh, uh, plans or ask you how your plans are going and give you that support and encouragement that we all need. And then mid-year, I take what I call a mid-year review to recalibrate because sometimes I get so stressed out and I feel like, oh my goodness, the year is going, what have I done? But it's very important to take a breath and stop and say, okay, what have we done well? What have I not done well? Um, and I always say we because I always I'm working with teams, so I don't do stuff alone. And then lastly, like I mentioned that, you know, it's very important to keep in mind how you will recharge. And when I think about what's my motto in life, you know, that generating success for others, it is very important to me. So when I'm feeling down, when I'm getting a little bit depressed, when I don't wanna do the things that I know I must do and I'm demotivated and demoralized, I think about the bigger picture. I think about, okay, um, who, today that I could have talked to and I could have made a difference in their lives or I could have sent an email that could have made a difference in someone's life just because I don't feel like it and I just feel like being lazy for a couple of days or I'm down in the dumps. So I always think about who because of me becoming self-focused who is missing out on something and whose life could have changed if I had made a little bit of effort. Um, so that's very important for me. And I encourage everybody, you can make a list of, so that's how I recharge and make a list of how you recharge um, when you are feeling down or you feel success is just somewhere in the distance and you're not gonna be able to attain anything. You're being overwhelmed. I think for me, that's very important. And I'll stop there. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you so much for sharing, Bukamu. And as you would note on the chats, I'm just noting a few highlights, um, something that we can take away from each and everyone who's going to share uh, how they plan for the year and tips on how, you know, this is what I liked, uh, what Bukamu talked about, keeping in mind how we will reach us because we often forget that there'll be pitfalls um, throughout the journey. And when we get to the pitfalls, we struggle to find ways to get out of the pitfall. So it is very important to find ways to recharge. And um, as she has said, I cannot emphasize more on how it is important to do that list that she talked about, the recharge list. Uh, who else would want to share uh, a bit on how they plan for the year or they've planned for this decade and um, more? Do we have um, somebody who has something to share? Okay, in any case, maybe Derek, you'd want to uh, throw in a bit of a, for, from what Bukamu and uh, Chooks have said, maybe there's something that you'd like to add. Uh, no, I think that the, the I, I was just writing a little note. I think what Bukamu said is very salient and I love that it is a, something that she considers and does on a regular basis. It involves her personal development, her spiritual development, her professional development, and how all of those things come together to doing something for the continent. And I will be a bit repetitive in that. I just think that, you know, we're living in very, very interesting times, interesting times in this world, where a lot of the things that people took for granted, a lot of the institutions, a lot of the, the leadership, the nation states that people believed in, have fallen short. And I think that at the same time, with all the ch challenges that we face, we find that there are many things that are moving in the right direction in Africa, for Africa, amongst Africans. And part of the reason that I came back and I wanted to launch my project here is because I want to plant a flag to say, hey, this is the future of the continent. We are the future of the continent. We are speaking for ourselves and we are building the world that we want to live in. And I think that the personal development of everyone on this call combined with the commitment to provide or, or to dedicate or to, to offer more of yourself than simply your own success, but mm -hmm. to commit to 
doing something that contributes to our communities, our continent, our world at large, that that can have a material impact on the future of the African continent. And that's what I'm seeking to do. I, and I believe that's what many of you are seeking to do. And I'm privileged and excited that we have the opportunity to work on these things together. Thank you so much, Derek. I think this is uh, what you've just said is actually what brings us together um, as uh, members of um, Yalda, serving purpose to our, uh, and giving back to our communities within Africa. Uh, not just being um, by the fence and watching as things happen, but actively contributing. And it's important as people who have decided that we're going to stand out and contribute actively um, towards um, our continent's development, to also have times for ourselves, um, reflect um, in our personal journeys because they make us, they strengthen us. And, um, and whoever came with this, this topic is, came up with a very brilliant topic and was very thoughtful because often we tend to forget ourselves as we are trying to be Africa's, um, you know, soldiers. We tend to forget that sometimes we have to sit down and reflect. And thank you so much for coming up with that topic. I think we should have somebody who would want to add on to this because I, I've been noting a, a lot of tips that I'm going to apply on my own personal life. And I think there's still more that people can share with us. Um, we are left with just a few minutes before we close off, but I can open up for one or two comments. And I can see there's a lot of us here. We can't just have people leaving without having said a word, or at least having commented on the chat side. Abineida. Anybody? Abineida, <laughs> you can comment. Abineida or Tosin, somebody can comment. Um, maybe I can comment on something. Um, so Derek talked about putting yourself in the path of opportunity. And I feel like one of the things you can do to put yourself in the path of opportunity is to volunteer. Because through volunteership, you're exposed to a lot of uh, contexts that obviously um, you may not have been privy to or a lot of projects or people it's a networking opportunity it's an opportunity to learn so i think because i have volunteered this would be my second year and i have had an amazing experience my 2019 was extremely um successful if i could say so just because i got um i got to volunteer with the alda and i got opportunities i have never had before so when you think about putting yourself in the path of opportunity, it doesn't necessarily need to be something, um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's what I want to say. It could be something as simple as giving back, as using your, the skills you already have to make someone else's life better or to solve um, a challenge within your community, or it could be anything, but just lending yourself and your time and your skills and your mind to a cause that you love, I think could have um, great rewards in as far as opening other doors. I think we had a speaker last year, his name is Mark, and he talked a lot about um, just being able to give back, which is what he does. So I think volunteering also um, is a way through which you can get exposure and, and do a lot more and sort of grow yourself uh, as you go towards achieving your goals and realizing your potential. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't see that my mic was muted. I was just saying that um, thank you so much for highlighting that um, um, Achieng is a way, volunteering as a way of getting exposure. It's one of the very important things, especially if you don't get opportunities that people like Derek might have gotten because uh, of what was happening maybe within their families. It's important to also put yourself out there for exposure to come to you because exposure wouldn't just come in most cases. And also, we did talk about um, be going crazy when we have a set of visions. 
but when we break down our visions, we have to be as realistic as possible. But uh, of course, we shouldn't really limit ourselves as much as possible. That's my opinion, but I'm sure somebody might have something to add. I'm just going to see. Uh, First Lady, wouldn't you um, want us to hear your voice? Um, Patsy, I think Derek needs to go. And so oh. we need to get his last comments and we can continue the conversation because I see a lot of people are now typing in the chat. Mm. Um, but there was a question directly to Derek from Tosin. Yeah, that's the question. So the question is, did you super. see it, Derek? Oh. Yeah, so here saying what are the current challenges you're facing now with this new project i mean there have been so many there are obviously the basic ones there's logistics there's financing there's actually where do you locate the project and put it in the right place there's the human resources how do you identifying the right people to do it there's the partnerships and the business development how do you actually sell which companies do you sell to in order to have a, a more of a strategic value than uh what um is you know, just cash money. There's additionally, someone was asking me the other day, why I haven't reached out to the governments and the countries we're launching in. There are a lot of challenges that come in when you get involved with governments. We've elected one government that we're like, we're gonna do some simple collaborations with them because there's a level of transparency there that we think will be good for us, good for them, good for everyone. But it is a, a a lot of things, and we find ourselves just solving for them one by one by one. And so far, I'm quite pleased with the way that things are going. But also, the way that I operate, we we don't just say, "Hey, this is how we are going to get it." We have multiple scenarios where we're like, "If this, then that. If that, then that. If these don't do this, then these guys might this." And we literally create sort of a strategic architecture for what gives us the best chance to win. And um, that's what I've spent the last year doing is putting the pieces of that architecture in place. That's why I'm like, oh, we're launching this year because I'm like, I have, I won't say I have everything that I need, but I kind of have everything that I need, you know? So maybe there's more things that I want, but I have the things that I need. And that is a very great place to be. And I think if my, I could say a last thing to you guys, I'm really, really encouraged because I met Bukamu when she was an undergraduate. Uh, I was already in grad school at the time, and I'm so impressed with what she's been doing. You know, I learned about Yalda literally, like, I don't know, 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. It's been a strong minute, and I'm just very, very proud that you guys have carried this forward into a new generation of leadership and finding ways to connect and encourage one another. I think that walking you know kind of hand in hand with truthfulness and honesty about what it takes to accomplish something meaningful is extremely powerful and that these networks and relationships that we're building will hopefully bear fruit in multiple ways ways that we may not even imagine today i'm grateful to be a part of it and thank you i have to go and take my kids out for dinner because i'm leaving uh traveling again Thank you Tomorrow, so much, so Derek. I need to see them before they go to bed. So I'll bid you guys yeah. adieu. Thank you so much, Derek. <laughs> and I look forward to the next time. You oh, got of it. course. Cheers, we have learned Patsy. so much from you over this last hour that we've been with you. And I hope this is not the last time we're hearing from you. It won't be. We will definitely do more for sure. Thank you so much, Derek. We release you. But guys, um, the conversation is Thank not you. over because Derek is leaving. Um, because I've, I've been seeing a lot of uh, things coming up on this chat side, and uh, I want to I want to encourage people to be brave enough to speak on the mic. I'm also brave in myself, so let's just do this. Uh, see that Tanda did say something about consistency. Open up your mic. I want you to speak up on this one, Tanda. Gavin. Gavin, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, everybody. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my network is not the best because uh, we have power outage. Okay. In regards to consistency, it's it's one of the biggest lessons I learned last year, and 
over a couple of years because many of us started a lot of very good, big, hairy, audacious projects, but because we're not consistent, we start something, we leave it half, we go and start another thing. But after being consistent at something I decided to do last year, I did it for the whole year at the, a particular project. I realized how much better I was than many people whom I, I felt intimidated when I started. And so it brought me to the realization that consistent at anything, you can actually be any intelligent relies on their intelligence than their share hard work and skill added to their intelligence. Oh, that's really important, um, as you've put it, uh, Tanda. Um, I, uh, we, we know that sometimes, um, as Gugamu did say, we, we tend to have these moments where we're really down. But as she said, we need to have those recharge strategies or the recharge list because if we don't have that, we there's no way we are going when we're where we are going to be consistent. So thank you so much for for highlighting the importance of consistency, Prince. Oh, I have to really go because we're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Um, okay, Prince was talking about you can key into an already moving train, someone's vision, and then making it work. I guess this is what exactly we're doing here. Uh, as um, Yalda, the, the Yalda movement, we have come together because we've seen that we have we have the same purpose to serve and we are seeing how we can plug into each other's strengths and have a, a very much bigger impact. Um, in wrapping up, because I should think people have things to get to, some have just woken up, some are just about to get ready for bed, um, some are just about to go out. Um, this has been the most meaningful webinar, um, and I guess a very good way to start off the year. Some of us maybe have might have just decided that we are going to go with the flow. But as we sit and reflect, we see the importance of there are so many ways of planning out how the year should maybe unfold. I've seen maybe a lot of years back that putting up um, the, the resolutions doesn't work for me. So I have decided that I do a list of intents. I have things that I have that I put down that my intention is to achieve this by this period. And some of you might have the vision boards please please if you have something that you really believe in that can work for you some of you manifest or do they, they keep like a manifestation book whatever that is but have something that you do in order to plan for the year do not just say you'll roll with it because if you sit and reflect you have nothing to reflect on because you didn't have anything planned um i encourage you to go and sit down and look up on how what what you're comfortable on doing in order to plan for the year and um we are going to come back at the end of the year to do it to reflect on what we have achieved i'm sure the team that plans on the webinar would have something to say let's reflect on what we've achieved over the last 12 months so as we close off it was wonderful having you i've seen that we have people from all over africa each and every corner of Africa was represented in as much as we were not a very large number. And I would have loved to have everybody, each and every one of us say something because we are quite a small number. And, um, but I'm still sure that I'm still very optimistic that in as much as we might have not all said everything, there's a lot that we've picked from this conversation that we had with Derek. And um, we're going to spend the rest of our Saturday Sunday Oh, Tosin. Yeah, how are you? Yes, maybe you have a burning question, burning issue. No, no, no. I just want to uh, commend uh, the platform. The presentation was wonderful, and I learned a lot. And uh, I look forward to uh, preview, uh, subsequent uh, webinars that we'll be doing. Hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Tosin. And then wrapping up, right, we, we have we have a webinar per month, and we have different themes for all these webinars that we host throughout the year. 
and you should look out for these webinars. I, I'm not sure how each and everyone might have heard of this webinar, but whatever source that you got to get this information about the webinar from, please keep on visiting it for more information about the upcoming events and webinars. And um, do feel free to also reach out to us regarding anything and everything that you might want to hear us or uh, have the other planning team tackle. Um, I appreciate each and everyone for having set time aside for this. And in saying that we are wrapping up, we can dismiss, class dismissed. Let's go and um, see what we have planned for the rest of the year. Thank you so much.